Hey guys, I'm Chasing Daylight here, so I will be brief. Here's the equipment we'll be using. It's an old uh, Dayton Speed Air compressor here. We will be pumping this up to about 90 pounds per square inch, running everything through a regulator that takes everything down to 15 pounds per square inch. And that is because our hobby airbrush requires no more than 15 pounds per square inch. Some of the safety equipment that we'll be using. And uh, here's the, uh, the actual stuff that we'll be using. I will be doing a 50-50 blend of Tactical Coyote Brown, Tactical Woodland Brown, and of course that's going to be 12 parts of whatever that ends up being to one part of Duracoat hardener. This is an epoxy, not a regular paint. All this stuff is going to be mixed right in here and then attached to the airbrush. Uh, don't steal your wife's spoons. She doesn't like that. I still have the scars. And now here's a, uh, a concept that I'm going to throw out here. I will be painting my uh, my Savage 12FV Varmint Rifle with its custom stock, but as excited as I am to paint that, I'm always going to go for the cheapest part first. I would recommend this for any of you. Get the cheapest part that you have. This is my, this is just a Caldwell bipod. It's kind of one of their uh, uh, medium tall models, I guess. And this is definitely the cheapest thing on that gun, so I will be painting this first. Since I have a pretty big project to do, I will go ahead and do, well, I'll tell you what, let's only do two tablespoons. I can't really remember how it went last time, but I'll do, uh, I'll do two tablespoons of Duracoat and then a half teaspoon of the hardener. All right, so here goes. One tablespoon of Coyote. Make sure to give it a good stir. Again, I have two different colors of Duracoat in here, and I want to make sure that the hardener also is completely mixed into this. I don't want to have one section that takes five hours to dry, and then one section that only takes about 30 seconds. As it is, one of the most amazing things about Duracoat is once it comes out of that nozzle, it dries within minutes. It's it's really really fast. You can handle it almost immediately. I'm gonna grab some gloves too. From now on, the video is gonna sound like this: screaming children and uh, Darth Vader. The two are not connected. All right, time for celebrity impressions. Blah blah blah, Batman. Okay, let's do a little test. All right, air is moving through just fine. And now I'm going to, I will gradually open up the nozzle here until I start seeing a nice spray. There we go, that's what I'm after. Keep the coats nice and light at first here. You don't really have to get full coverage, you can come back and do another pass. And the lighter that you are with how you apply this, the flatter it's going to end up. I've seen some of these Duracoat jobs out there and they end up looking pretty shiny. Duracoat should be extremely flat. I should have mentioned some of the other prep work that went into this. Uh, this right here is mostly aluminum, I think, uh, aluminum. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's pretty slick. So what I had to do was get some, uh, I took some 200 grit sandpaper and I roughed it up first. And that's a good thing to do before you paint anything. Texture it up a bit. 
Now there are some parts on the rifle itself that I am not going to rough up just because if I ever want to recover the rifle I don't want one that's all chewed up. I haven't really had difficulty in the past with, uh, with Duracoat adhering except to a couple of aluminum items. Uh, if you have an item that is parkerized, then that's fine. But I have encountered some things where it's just kind of raw aluminum or somebody has put some kind of non-parkerizing uh, something on it. I don't know, maybe it was just anodized. But the Duracoat did not stick very well to that. In addition to the sanding, I also degreased this thing. And one of the neat things about Duracoat that I just mentioned is how quickly it dries. I could probably just go ahead and grab one of these, manipulate it, and move it around. Yeah, see, nothing came away. It's still stuck there. Not bad. You can see already, because of the way that I've applied the Duracoat here, that it's all very rough looking, it's all very flat. Uh, there isn't much shine. There are a couple spots, like I can see right in here a little bit, but once this is completely coated, it should look really nice. Okay, that's pretty fair coverage right there. I'm going to let this sit for just a few minutes. I'm going to move on to the next piece. I'm going to let this one sit for a bit, and then I'll come back and I'll hit it with another uh, light coat after maybe about 15 minutes. Uh, it's, it, this process is just so fast, and it doesn't really take that much to get good coverage. Here's an array of parts that I need to spray. I have these new uh, leapers rings that I need to take care of, so I'll do those right now. And uh, this is the bolt on the back of the, uh, the Savage bolt, actually. It's a huge thing. It looks like an automotive bolt. Uh, just a couple random parts, like this came off the, uh, the bipod. And then I have the bolt handle. And this little whatchamahoozy goes between the bolt and the, uh, the receiver. So I guess it kind of functions like a washer. Not entirely sure. But, uh, let's get these things painted. I should have remembered to mask off the rifle earlier, but, uh, oh well, it's a pretty quick job actually. It's a simple gun, it's not a semi-auto or anything. Bolt actions are easy, so all I have to do is I'm just going to take some, uh, some cotton balls here. I'm going to stuff them in the action just to keep a little overspray out. And uh, I will tape off the buttstock here. This, uh, this recoil pad. And aside from that, this should be good to go. I've already degreased this. I sprayed it down with some brake cleaner, did some other stuff to it. So everything should be nice and dry and ready to accept the dirt coat. Right here is the, uh, the fire indicator. It lets you know if it's safe, if it's ready to fire, or if it's in that half position, which allows the bolt to be manipulated, but will not allow the, uh, the trigger to do anything. Uh, so yeah, I'm just going to tape that little guy off because I want to keep him. Again, start with some place that isn't the most important. Then work your way forward.
Okay, I'm pretty happy with how the action looks. I think that's pretty decently covered. I'm going to be adding the extra colors of camo too, so I don't want to get that too thick. Uh, I have a little bit on the top of the barrel, but basically I need to cover the rest of it. So I took the action out and I'm going to be covering the barrel. All right, I have pretty good coverage on the outside of this thing. So I think next I'm gonna be moving to the, uh, the tip of the barrel just to make sure. I'm running out of Duracoat, so I better get to that. A little bit of cotton there. Keep this stuff out. Now it doesn't really matter if some of the Duracoat makes it into the, the end of the, uh, uh, like around the crown there, or into the, uh, the actual bore. Uh, I mean, if there's just tiny little bits, it's going to get blown out after the first shot. But might as well keep it out of there if I can. Four tablespoons of Duracoat, one teaspoon of the hardener, and everything has the base color in at least two coats. The bipod is pretty heavily coated, which is probably a good idea because this one's going to be beaten around a lot. The barrel didn't get quite as much as I would like. I would have liked a third coat on this, but this should be plenty. Um, I will be, of course, putting on the camo colors, so that's going to help beef things up just a little bit. If I see any thin spots, I can go in and pinpoint them. The stock, this one was pretty surprising. Uh, I hadn't painted wood before. The, the guns that I've done in the past have all been either full metal or metal and plastic. So this one absorbed quite a bit of the Duracoat. It took, it took more than I expected. So if you're going to paint some kind of laminate or other wood um, stock or something like that, then I recommend that you go ahead and add just a little bit more Duracoat than you would think. Pretty happy with how this came out. I have a nice, neat, crisp line where the action meets the stock. And I kept, even though I put a little bit of Duracoat into the barrel channel, just to kind of keep some contrast down, I of course left everything alone back in here. I don't want any Duracoat on my uh, bedding material. I don't want to be adding any extra thickness. As it is, it's a perfect press fit for my action, and I don't want to go messing that up. It's been about a week. My two coats have very thoroughly dried, I'm sure. And I'm moving on to the next step. Next step is going to be our second color, Woodland Brown. And I'm just going to be following the same pattern that you can see here on the scope and on my other rifle. Uh, why be so boring? Why do the same camouflage? Well, for one, it's really effective, and number two, I already own the Duracoat and it's expensive. <laughs> so, no big experimentations here. We're just going to do the, uh, the same thing, and this is going to end up working really well. Just like last time, it's all about small shapes, small patterns. On some of the, uh, the bigger items, I can use some of the larger ones, but even those, I'm not going to get much bigger than these. It's all about small stuff. Because with these, you can create infinite little variations and uh, neat little complex patterns that you really can't get with some of the bigger stuff. Also, I'm not going to be adhering these. So what I'm going to need to do is make sure that I get full coverage this time on one pass. So when I hold the stencil up to the surface, I'm going to spray it until I get pretty full coverage, pull it off, that's it. Uh, I mean, if I really needed to, I could go back, hold it up, and spray another little section. 
but I'm going to try to get full coverage, one pass. This isn't going to be a multiple coat solution for these colors. Here are some new extra small shapes. These make it a lot easier to do things on this sort of, uh, these small things. Once you're pretty well satisfied with how the coverage is, you think you have enough shapes to kind of break this up. Now it's time to break those shapes up a little bit. And what I like to do is use this, just a single little square kind of dot. And I apply these on the corners and in random spots uh, to kind of increase the frequency of uh, just these little elements that break things up and it's it really works wonders All right, bigger surface. We can use a few of these bigger shapes. You can see here that I'm wrapping things around corners. That's gonna help break up that shape when viewed from different angles. When we last left our heroes, things were looking pretty grim. Uh, I smashed the bottle that was actually pretty full of uh, Woodland Brown here. Uh, so I lost a lot of Duracoat, lost that bottle, so now I have to work in smaller quantities. Um, some things came out pretty well. You can see here that uh, I have a pretty full pattern going on the stock. Now what I need to do is start rolling it over onto the barrel and finish things up here. I'm not really concerned about getting a pattern on the underside of the barrel. Um, I had thought about doing that, but I think I'm just going to skip it. Uh, I like kind of the light color inside there. That way, if it's in shadow, you know, like light is coming down on it, at least it'll be nice and light on the inside. It'll kind of defray some of the shadow you would get from these shapes. Uh, aside from that, things are looking pretty good. And uh, also on the breakage issues, I just ran this thing through my compressor. So uh, I've taped up this side and I'm running on one lung. Wish me luck. Like I've discussed in older videos, there are a few tricks to making this digital camouflage work really well. First, is to make sure that you have some of these shapes to go over edges, go onto other pieces. You can see that these are connected things that wrap around edges like this one or here or down here we have some that wrap around that's going to help to break up the shape really well when it's viewed from other angles you want to be able to lose the edges of your uh, actual piece second you want to use small little templates like these to create larger more complicated ones that way you don't have to actually stick anything down. You don't have to try to mess with big fancy stencils. Just take small ones and stack them all together. And then finally, this is the real trick to making this stuff work. This single pixel element. What you do is you just pop these around your edges at various places. You can kind of hang them out in space. And what these will do, these will really help to create that small frequency or high, high frequency 
uh, you know, kind of small amplitude stuff. And it helps to make it blend in just a little bit more. It gets rid of the blocky shapes and starts to fuzz them out as distance increases. And you'll see how good that's going to look here in a second. Look at the difference one little dot makes. It very quickly turns those big blocking looking patterns into something that looks much more organic, especially as you step back. We're going to do the same treatment with green, and in the end we're going to add some, uh, uh, some very little bit of lighter colored tan on top of that, and the end result is going to look really good. Here's what we have so far. Three color camouflage. And you'll note that while the camouflage is looking really good, it's just kind of missing something. The whole thing is kind of flat. And that's because all of these tones are very similar to each other uh, in terms of brightness. We don't have anything that's really making anything pop out um, as if it were raised up out of the object or sunk in. And we could get some of that depth if we included some really dark colors or some really light. Now I don't have anything darker than that woodland brown just because that's what I bought at the time, uh, but I do have some lighter colors. So what we're going to do now is add, I'm going to do mostly the coyote brown, straight coyote brown, and I'm going to add just a little bit of the desert beige to lighten everything up. And the trick to this color, at least in this area, if you're in the desert you might want to go with more light colors, but out here in my area where it's a lot of woodland, a lot of prairie, you want to keep things light. So what I've done is I've only pulled out my little templates that are the smallest ones. This is the biggest that I'm going to go. And I won't do many of these. Just a few. Mostly I'm going to do these small shapes and coverage is going to be sparse. It's going to be nothing like what I did with the green or the woodland brown. The light colors are going to be very uh, kind of small and interspersed. Here's the finished product. You can see that the small amount of the light color that we added really helps to break up the shapes on here. It gives a little bit of dimensionality that it wouldn't otherwise have. On top, I have my eight and a half to 25 by 44 Mueller uh, second focal plane mill dot rifle scope. I'm really looking forward to getting this thing out on the range, especially out on the prairie dog fields. Because this thing finally has a nice vertical grip, which is going to uh, make things a lot more comfortable for me. The comb is the right height. 14 and a half inch length of pull which is what I need for my arms. This thing is perfectly fit to me. And the prairie dogs won't even see it coming.